Hello, everybody. This is your favorite comic book podcast about 1970s and 80s comic books, Flea Market Fantasy. This is number 25. And as always, this is your co-host, Mike L. And I am joined by... Michael Dell of the LCS Hockey Radio Show. That's right. And this week... It is Mike Dell's pick. So, Mike Dell, why don't you tell us what you got for us this week? <clears throat> yeah, I know this is going to confuse a lot of people, but it is my pick, and I'm picking a DC comic book that features Batman. I think, yeah, I don't know what happened. This must be the Earth 2 Mike Dell, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, we're going to be reviewing Justice League of America 196 from 1981. And this was written by Jerry Conway and uh, illustrated by George Perez. Yes, and it's funny because I actually own this comic. Ah, nice. But yeah, I'd like to know what made you pick this one. Well, here's the deal, Mike. When I was a little kid, uh, one of my fondest childhood memories is my dad would take me, uh, when I had to go get a haircut, okay. he would say, you go get your haircut, I'll take you to the newsstand and, and get you a comic book. So uh, we'd always do that. And then I, I would go at the newsstand and I would look at all the comics. This was in the old days, you know, okay. 1981, obviously. Sure. <laughs> and uh, and uh, they would just be on those little racks, like metal racks, yeah. you know. Spinner racks, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I would just look for the covers that looked cool. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell you what, a lot of Justice League covers had a lot of punching and a lot of fighting. <laughs> Yeah, that's and true. like a group of bad guys against the group of good guys. So I would tend to buy some of those books. And this uh, issue we're doing here uh, today is part of a three issue arc uh, that covers Justice League 195, 196, and 197. And it features a group of supervillains fighting uh, superheroes, and it's it's tremendous. It's everything a comic book should be when you're a kid. A hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. And it's funny because I, you know, I've always loved Justice League and I love these creators, but I didn't realize until this week that Jerry Conway did eight years worth of Justice League. Did you know that? I, I just was doing the research here. It's actually longer than that. Oh, really? OK. Um, if you if you consider his like his first time, uh, I was going to talk about this later, but uh, his first issue of Justice League was issue 125. He did a couple like in a row. OK. And then he. He left DC and he went back to Marvel and then he came back and then he did uh, Justice League for, I think, maybe eight years straight. OK, there you go. Yeah. But overall, Wait. he actually wrote Justice League for a span of like 11 years. That's amazing. Um, yeah, we can talk more about that later. But this is obviously like I don't I didn't have any Justice League when I was a little kid, but I certainly picked up a few, you know, as the years went by and. This has got to be the best period, the peak period, especially because we've got George Perez on inks, but or on pencils, I mean. Yeah. But yeah, we could talk about that later. Yeah, we'll get into because we've already talked about Conway and Perez a bunch yes. on the show, but uh, we'll highlight their Justice League stuff later. Absolutely. But, uh, all right. So before we get into this book, Michael, there is a lot of characters here. Yes. And there's some pretty obscure characters, so maybe we should just go through them first. Yeah, well, the, the, we, I mean, we've talked about the whole multiple Earths thing on this show. So if people know at DC, there's Earth 1, Earth 2, as well as a bunch of other ones. But we'll just yeah. talk about those for now. Yeah, this is um, pre-crisis. Right, so. right. So at this point in DC's history, Earth 1 is basically the present day mainstream, like the main canon versions of all these characters like superman batman the flash wonder woman green lantern and then earth 2 is all the versions of those characters from the 1940s which they kind of just rewrote and pretended they're on a different earth so that's the easiest way to explain it yeah i i like earth 2 because earth 2 is awesome yes it's like golden age heroes and stuff and uh right they're over there so yeah, like what, what was uh, Justice League, uh, Justice Society of America, right? Exactly, right, right. That's, That's the easiest it. way to remember it. Yeah, yeah. And okay. so yeah, and so beyond you know Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman having slightly different costumes, um, some of them, some of the other characters are completely different. Like the Flash, uh, Hawkman, the Atom, and uh, Green Lantern, they're completely different characters, and some of the villains are completely different. But um, so yeah, do you want to go one by one here with who's in? Yeah, this stuff? I, I think that would be the uh, the best. I, I have a big list of all the characters. Sure. Here, so. Okay. <clears throat> what we're talking about here is first uh, the Justice League of America. Some of their characters are featured, and there, there's five uh, characters from there, I believe. So we got 
the atom. Yep. And this is the Ray Palmer version of the atom. Exactly. Who who's the guy who can shrink, uh, become real tiny? Mm -hmm. Can he get like he can't get real big, right? He can just get no, small. no, only only small. He, he can get to microscopic size. Yeah. Okay. His first appearance was Showcase 34, 1961. Mm -hmm. so this is an old school guy. Uh, he created by Julius Schwartz, Gardner Fox, and Gil Kane. Mm. Then we got Batman. I think everyone's familiar with the Batman. Yep. I don't need to get into him. Next, we have Black Canary. Yep. I got to tell you, Michael, when I was a little kid, I was smitten with Black Canary. Oh, yeah? <laughs> well, yeah, the fish, it's the fishnets. It is the fishnets. Oh, boy. Yep. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Black <laughs> Canary. Yeah, uh, her real name is Dinah Laurel Lance. Yep. And her first appearance was Justice League 75 in 1969, created by Denny O'Neill and Dick Dillon. Mm -hmm. And I believe, Michael, if I read this properly, she was the character who suggested the name Justice League of America. Oh, uh, well, that might have been a retcon because it, she was not in the original version of their origin. Yeah, she was only in issue 75. But or maybe there could they possibly be taught because this Black Canary is the daughter of the original Black Canary. Which is confusing, right? Because uh, that might have been a retcon too. I think I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very confusing. Yeah, <laughs> but basically, her mother was the original Black Canary, and her father was a police officer. So she just took over the mantle from her mom. And also, she has a superpower where she can scream like a like a bird. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> and, a weird and power. And I guess it's uh, because she has a meta gene that makes her a meta human. Mm -hmm. sure. Of course, even that's different. Like I guess that's the retcon version. Yeah, of it. I think the original it was just like a little device on her neck or something. I'm not even sure. I think the and I think the golden age green or black canary didn't have any powers, as far as I know. And she is a uh, master of the the martial arts. Yeah, but she doesn't have like super strength or anything. She's just a normal lady. Right, and and she did. She was portrayed in um, Arrow, the TV show Arrow, for a few seasons. So people are probably familiar with her now. Yeah, because uh, her, her lover was the Green Arrow, Michael. That's right. That's right. Now, did they ever get married? Maybe they did, but they probably wiped that out by now. Now, let me ask you this, Michael. You're you're a comic book historian. Maybe you'll know this. Okay. So, uh, Marvel has Hawkeye. Yes. And Green Arrow was before Hawkeye, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And, of course, Robin Hood was before both of them. Yeah. Uh, but also, you have Black Canary being in a romantic relationship with Green Arrow. And yes. then in Marvel, you have Hawkeye in a romantic relationship with Mockingbird. Yes. Basically, their answer to Black Canary. 100%. Yes. That had to be planned. Yes. Like, someone had to just do this on purpose, right? Totally. You're right. You're right. <laughs> That's very Ridiculous. strange. Yeah. All right. Uh, next, we got Firestorm. Oh, I love Firestorm. Uh, his first appearance was Firestorm 1, 1978, and he was created by Jerry Conway and Al Milgram. You love Al Milgram, too. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't like his art, but he's <laughs> cool. You know, he's a good guy. <laughs> and explain Firestorm to people, Michael. Firestorm can turn, he can transmute any element, any other element. So, you know, he could take, I don't know, a table and turn it into metal he could turn iron into, or sir he can turn fire into like ice anything there's really no limit to what he can do he's very powerful and on top of that he shares his consciousness yes with uh, a scientist so ronnie raymond turns into firestorm but when he does he merges bodies with ronnie raymond and ronnie raymond becomes kind of like his conscious conscience well, well it's ronnie raymond and the professor martin right Stein. Sorry, right. Martin Stein, that's right. Yeah. I uh, Ro that. Ronnie Raymond is like what, like a college kid? Yeah, he's like a jock, jock college kid, right. And Martin Stein's an older college professor. Exactly. And uh, so when they form, like when they form Firestorm, what happens, like Ronnie Raymond's in Toledo, <laughs> I don't yeah. know, and Martin Stein's in, you know, Chicago, and, and they want to create Firestorm, do they just somehow disappear and like reform yeah or? there have been there have been issues where martin stein will encounter danger and he'll just he'll just will it and then ronnie raymond's in the shower and he just disappears <laughs> from the shower and becomes firestorm and then yeah it's ridiculous but it's awesome <laughs> right it can create some awkward situations for yeah, sure Yeah, like, like someone's talking to martin stein in the library somewhere and he just suddenly disappears how exactly. does he explain that like yeah, how do you, you can't 
<laughs> it sounds like the makings of a great TV show, if you ask me. Well, he's on that show, right? Isn't he on the uh, Arrow and stuff? Yeah, but they they don't really do it well. You know, they don't really do it right, in my opinion. But whatever. And the other cool thing about Firestorm is he has this crazy. I liked him when I was a kid too. I had some Firestorm mm-hmm. issues. Uh, it, by the way, isn't it? Now that I'm thinking about it, didn't Marvel do a similar thing with Nova? Uh, no, well, Nova, I don't think. No, he never. No, no, he never merged with anybody. He but was didn't like, he share a consciousness with somebody? No, that was Captain Marvel or Marvel. Kind of. That's kind of where they got the idea from Firestorm. Is that Captain Mar- Marvel? Marvel. He has like fifteen different iterations where it's like they created him, and then two years later they changed his power, and then two years later they changed it again. And one of the versions was that he traded spaces with um, Rick Jones, and so Captain Marvel would be doing his thing, and then when, whenever he was done having his adventure, he would trade spaces with rick jones and then rick jones would come into our reality and then captain marvel would disappear but whenever they disappeared they would go into this like limbo and they would just float around and do nothing for like two days straight you know and then they'd come back yeah and and they could communicate with each other you know while they were in our reality so it's kind of like firestorm but the difference is with firestorm he actually they actually merge into one body with two consciousness consciousnessness yeah uh but i was thinking nova with the yellow helmet you know that guy yeah like, yeah of course like did he have uh some sort of relationship with the professor or something no or? not as far as i know i did read a few issues but i don't think so no i gotta look this up and anyway all right um so that's firestorm and then the final member of justice league of america that's in this issue is wonder woman yeah i think we all know wonder woman absolutely all right so that gets us to uh justice society of america Mm-hmm. And again, these are the Earth Two kids. And mm-hmm. first, we got the Flash, but like you said, this is a different Flash, right? Uh, what, what's this guy's name? This is instead of Barry Allen. This is Jay Garrick. Jay Garrick. And, yeah, he's got a red and blue costume with a yellow uh, lightning bolt pointing up. And instead of a mask, he wears a ha- like a helmet, like um, the Roman or Greek god Hermes or um, Mercury. Yeah, the little wings. Right, right. And uh, yeah, the red shirt, blue pants, and boots. And yeah, and he's an older fellow. So. Yeah, because the, the idea is that these Earth Two superheroes all started their careers in the '40s, so they're all older men. Like by this, they're now what 20, 30, 40 years older than the Justice League members, right? So they're all have, yeah, they're all gray haired and wrinkly. <laughs> well, wrinkly, might, you know, wrinkly so. might be harsh yeah. <laughs> but it, it just seems like they always have gray hair around the temples to make them yeah. distinguished <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly it's just like they're not really older looking they just have gray temples you're right <laughs> now Hawkman is also here but he, he looks exactly like the other Hawkman from almost his, his helmet is slightly different if you notice um, besides the wings on his helmet he also has a little black hawk like a little shape of a black hawk on the front of his helmet, and the Earth One Hawkman does not have that. I didn't even notice that. All right, <laughs> so there you go. Did I mention I'll be alone on Valentine's Day? Anyway, go <laughs> ahead, Mike Dell. <laughs> so next up, we have Our Man. Now, this guy might be unfamiliar to a lot of folks. Our Man, uh, his real name is Rex Tyler. Yes. Uh, his first appearance was Adventure Comics 48 in 1940, and he was created by Ken Fitch and Bernard <laughs> Bailey. And basically, he was a, uh, a chemist, who was working on uh, Creighton Vitamins. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's called, what is it, uh, Miraclo? It's Miraclo, yeah. And he found out if he takes this pill, it will give him superpowers for one hour. Right. So every and every time he takes it, it's like, you know, it's a race against the clock. Yeah. Because <laughs> right? he only has an hour. Uh-huh. And his outfit is like black with like a yellow cape. And right. A cow and... Uh, it's a pretty cool outfit. For pretty, a super- yeah, it's a pretty unique outfit, to be honest, yeah. I like it. Uh, what, what else do you know about our man, Michael? Oh, not much. Um, he never <laughs> really caught my fancy. I'm not really a huge fan of our man. I know that later on, in um, it was Infinity Incorporated, there was another, I think it was his son, maybe, that took over the role I, of our I man. There were like three incarnations of our man. Yeah, he had a purple and red costume, and then later... There was a robot version of Our Man, and then there might have been another one. I'm not sure. Well, first of all, if you're a robot, you can't be called Our Man because you're not a man. A good point, yeah. (laughs) You should have been called Our Robot. Yeah. (laughs) Next up, we have Johnny Thunder 
and his Thunderbolt. Yes. His first appearance was Flash Comics number one, 1940. Awesome. Created by John B. Wentworth and Stan Ashmeyer. Mm. Uh, basically, Johnny Thunder was, to put this in simplest terms, he was the seventh son of a seventh son. Right. So it was believed he would have mystical power. So some country, some made up country, like kidnapped him or something and, and performed all sort of mystical rites with him to give him power. Right. Yes. And he was born in 1917, I believe. Right. I think they actually yes. specified that. At, yep. like, at like seven o'clock. Right. Um, Right. Yeah, there's all kinds of sevens. <laughs> right. So he was abducted as a child and taken to this country and raised into the mystic arts. And it, the what the big thing is he could summon this thunderbolt mm-hmm. who is depicted as a like a p- giant pink lightning bolt with a head and arms. Right. Like basically <laughs> a genie, right? Yeah, basically. And he, he could summon him uh, by saying the mystical words, uh, say you. Right. But it's spelled C E I space U, but it's pronounced say you. Mm. So occasionally he'll just be saying something and he will say the word say you and Thunderbolt. <laughs> but no one else can see Thunderbolt. He's invisible well, to everyone else. No, no, you know what's funny? I know that in this story he is invisible, but I thought that was just in that case. Like I thought in other cases he was visible. I, I, from what I read, he was invisible to all, all like no one okay. else could see him. Only Interesting. Him. Okay. What they picked up in the comics, so you know the readers could see him. Okay. Because like I guess his he would struggle with using this power, controlling Thunderbolt, and like wacky things would happen, and because uh, other because other people couldn't see Thunderbolt, so they would just okay. see this weird shit happening, and they're like, "What's going?" on? I think that's the best understanding okay. I have of it. And like like you said, that is how it's depicted in this story. No one else can see the Thunderbolt except him. Uh, so in, he's Johnny Thunder. He's kind of like a, uh, a snappy talker from the thirties. Right. Right. That quick, that quick patter. And he dresses in like a zoot suit, almost like crazy, right. outfit, like yes. crazy suits. Basically. So, yeah, it's funny, Michael, because when I'm going through this book and, and even though I was looking through some, uh, all-star squadron recently, okay. I, re- I see panels that I haven't seen in like almost 40 years, but I remember them distinctly. Wow. Like, oh, yeah, I remember this, I remember this, but I have no recollection of Johnny Thunder. <laughs> really? Really? Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Like, I didn't remember any of the Johnny Thunder stuff. That's funny. <laughs> but, and uh, you, know, there's a, you know, there's a new version of Johnny Thunder, like a, tw- like in the 2000s, they did a reboot, right? Okay. Yeah. And I believe he's, I, I know that he's black. Oh, all I right. I think he has a, it's like. I'm trying to, I'm going to look him up quick. There's another version. It's like, I don't want to say Joaquin Thunder. But it's, something, <laughs> it's something like that. Um, yeah, I'll look it up quick here. Um, just a minute here. But people, people that are listening, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess. It's, oh, no, sorry. So there was a Johnny Thunder female, Johnny Thunder, J-O-N-N-I. And then, um, yeah, see, I can't. Oh, here we go. Yeah, Joaquin, like J-A-K-E-E-M, John, Joaquin Thunder. Huh. So he's a, a black teenager, and it's basically the same idea. It's just, you know, in the 90s or whatever. Well, so. what does the what does his Thunderbolt look like? He looks exactly the same. Oh, really? I think, I think it's the same Thunderbolt, yeah. Because that's a very 1940s design of a Thunderbolt, you know what I mean? Like, it's weird. Totally, yeah, with the lightning coming out of his I thought they would have <laughs> updated it, but all right, fair enough. And the last Justice Society of America character in this issue is Superman. Of course. And again, this is the older Superman. So you, now you're, you're telling me he's not as powerful as the Earth One Superman. Yeah, right? they yeah they basically used all of his the way he was p- portrayed in like the late 30s and early 40s, where yeah. he wasn't as strong. And I'm that's, not sure. If he, yeah, he might have all of his powers, but just not as powerful. That's the b- best version of Superman. Like mm-hmm. you need you need Superman to be like an, a Superman, but not invo- like immune to everything. Like they just made him way too powerful. I have Wait. to agree. I, yeah, I, I do love all versions of Superman, but ideally he would be more like this. I agree. Yeah, the flying around the the the, the Earth and, and the, the rotation, yeah, counting yeah. the number of molecules on Earth. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so stupid. All right. Uh, so now, Michael, we have all these. We have these ten heroes. Mm-hmm. So now the opposing team in this uh, Titanic clash <laughs> is. A group that is known as the Secret Society of Supervillains. That's right. And this is the first appearance. This is their first appearance. This is as a group. Yes. Yeah. The initial 
uh, endeavor of this super society of supervillains. And Mike, oh, I mean, I don't know. I'm not very uh, busy these days. I got some free time. Would you like to start a new super society of supervillains with me? You mean a secret society of supervillains? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so, yes. that, so that no one actually knows about it? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, no one listens to the show. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it worked perfectly, yeah. Yes. We could plan actual crimes, like actual bank robberies yes. on the show, and yes. no one would ever know about them. You're right. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it would be something we could do, you know? Yeah. All right. Uh, now, the main guy behind this, the big brains here, mm-hmm. is a fellow named Ultra Humanite. Yes. He's the guy who co- concocts this plan, and we'll get into this plan here in a minute, but it's it's amazing. But uh, his first appearance was in Action Comics 13 in 1939, created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, and he is Superman's first recurring villain. He's okay. technically the first supervillain in history. Isn't that cool? Yeah, now originally he was... Uh, DC did this a lot with a lot of villains where they were just super smart. And, yes. like he, he was just super smart, and uh, but he was like an older fella... Like his brain was too powerful for his body, so his body was like shriveling up, and he, he had glasses and a little bald guy. But he uh, eventually, Mike Al, he his his true genius was that he he found a way to transfer his consciousness into other bodies. That's right. So he sometimes he'd be in a lady, sometimes he'd just be in a random dude. But eventually, he decided, hey, I, why am I monkeying around with other human bodies? <laughs> he takes a monkey from a Gorilla City, an albino gorilla. And he puts his consciousness in the brain of this uh, albino gorilla. So now he has big physical strength, too, to go with the brain. That's right. And this is tremendous. He's a great character. Uh, and I got to point out, have you seen the Justice League Unlimited cartoon? I have not. Oh, he's one of the main villains in that, and he's great. And he's a white monkey? Yes, he's a white monkey with a really cool voice. All right, cool. Yeah, because when I was a kid, I loved this ultra-human I guess. Yeah, like I I never realized he was another. I always thought he was a giant monkey. I didn't realize he was a human who put his mind. Like, you know what I mean? Like, sure, I didn't know. Sure. Yeah. Well, I got to say one other cool thing about him. Originally, he was portrayed as bald, as a Caucasian male that well, was bald. You know about this? Yeah, but you're wrong about this. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. <laughs> and that Lex Luthor was portrayed as a redhead. Yes. And then in one of his later appearances, the artist mixed them up and just drew. Lex That's Luthor, incorrect. That's, That's incorrect. incorrect. Oh, my whole life is a this. lie. We, we talked about this on the LCS show. And then I had a, I remember I, I sent you a link to a uh, comic book. Uh, what's that? There's a website that does oh, these. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think like, it's, it's on CBR, but it's a comic myths busted or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And it's actually a misconception. Yes. Ultra Humanite was depicted as bald, but he had glasses. But the guy who, because they changed the artists. So the guy who was supposed to draw Lex Luthor went back and looked. And he confused Lex Luthor with just a henchman who was bald. Oh. So he didn't confuse him with Ultra Humanite. It, it was another bald guy who was just a henchman. Got gotcha. And so, but you're correct that, that you, you, it was wrong that he depicted him as bald when he shouldn't have, but it wasn't the Ultra Humanite. Type. Gotcha. Okay. So it, yeah. is, it is kind of ironic, though, that it, like Ultra Humanite was first, but he's completely been forgotten, basically. Other yeah, than, and, you know, and, other than Justice Society. And when you think about it, he's basically just Lex Luthor. Exactly. He's <laughs> a really smart, bald guy. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Once you get away from the trend, you know, putting his consciousness in other bodies and stuff. Right. I mean, yeah. So that makes him different. And you know what really makes him different? He's in a big monkey body now. Yeah, I know. I know. It's so great, cool. isn't it? That is I Love cool. it. Yeah. And, and like, if you notice the ultra humanite, he's got the big cranium, uh, the big gorilla cranium. And like, there's always a, a vein on top of his head, like pulsating, just because his brain is so huge. Right. <laughs> he can't contain himself. Love it, yeah. So, all right. So, yeah, the Ultra Humanite, his plan in this three-issue arc is he's done some crazy calculations, Michael. Yes. And he has determined, because he broke out a slide rule in his abacus and he figured this out, that if he were to eliminate five heroes from Earth-1 and five heroes from Earth-2, it would throw the universe off balance. Yeah. Now, now, I know what you're thinking at home. You're thinking, well, why would that throw it off balance when you're eliminating five and five? Wouldn't it be better if you took maybe three and four? Yeah, I don't know. But <laughs> if you could take five from Earth 1 and five from Earth 2, it will throw the universe off balance. And what would happen, Michael? On one of these planets, all the heroes would disappear. This makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it makes no sense whatsoever. I know. But just buy into it. It's yeah. tremendous. <laughs> and Ultra Humanite's plan is he knows, because, you know, he's done these calculations. He right. knows what will really happen is that all the heroes will disappear from Earth, too. <laughs> right, right. Specifically, yeah. <laughs> But because he needs someone to get those villains out of Earth-1, he recruits supervillains from Earth-1 to do his dirty work. And he tells them that, hey, I don't know what's going to happen. All I know is that the universe will be off balance and all the heroes will disappear from one of the two Earths. But I don't know which one. <laughs> so do you want to be a part of this and flip a coin with me and see? Who knows? You Earth-1 villains could have free reign of Earth-1 with no heroes. How about it? And they're like, all right, let's do this. Yeah. So the Earth-1 villains that he recruits, I believe I have this correct, Brainwave, right? Yeah, Brainwave. And again, another really smart guy. Uh -huh. Right, <laughs> right. He's, a, he's just originally he was just a short guy with glasses, right? A short, bald guy with glasses. Yeah, a little bald guy with glasses who would use his psionic powers to appear like a big, strong, strapping supervillain in a costume and everything. Right. So everyone thought he was this big, handsome, strong guy, but actually he's a little fellow with glasses. Right. And his real name is Henry King Sr. And his first appearance was All-Star Comics 15 from 1943. And he was created by Gardner Fox and Joe Gallagher. Nice. So yeah, that's Brainwave, uh, and and his his arch villain is uh, or his arch rival is Johnny Thunder. Okay, that's who he goes after in this. Uh, then we have Cheetah, real name Deborah Domain, and her first appearance was Wonder Woman two seventy four nineteen eighty. I, and I this is yeah, this is the second Cheetah. An older character, yes. Yeah, so the Golden Age Cheetah is from like the forties for sure. Now, the Golden Age Cheetah, I believe, was her aunt. If I'm yeah, they, again, that, that gets into Earth-1, Earth-2 confusion, <laughs> because technically, they, they, they shouldn't be related because they're from two different dimensions, right? Oh, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I think at one point, you got to understand, what people don't, under, don't realize about DC is it's not like one day they said, okay, Everything before 1956 is Earth 2, and everything after is Earth 1. It wasn't like that. They would still have stories in the 60s and 70s where they would refer back to characters from the 40s as if they were on the same Earth. So yeah. this is an example, and then Batman would do it. Like There's four different clay faces, and they all existed. <laughs> on Earth. Like It's confusing as hell, you know? So Yeah, so, so in the continuity where she's the original Cheetah's, I believe, niece, uh, she was raised, she was like an environmental protection lady. She was very gung-ho about protecting the environment. And that led her to meet Wonder Woman because some oil tanker crashed. And it looked like her and Iron, or her and Wonder Woman were going to be buddies. They were hitting it off. But then uh, she went back, she got noticed that her aunt was dying, I believe. So she went to visit her aunt. And when her aunt died, the, the niece found that uh, her aunt was actually the original Cheetah. Awesome. And because she finds the mannequin with the costume, but the mannequin conks her on the head, Michael. It falls <laughs> over, conks her on the head, knocks her unconscious. While she's unconscious, some supervillains hench sent his henchmen to get the original Cheetah. But when they find her dead, they, they kidnap the niece in the Cheetah outfit, and they put her... So the supervillain, I can't remember his name, it begins with a D, but he decides, <laughs> I'm going to uh, create my new Cheetah from this lady, and he subjects her to intense brainwashing. He, it's kind of like uh, Clockwork Orange. He forced okay. her to watch all these uh, clips of uh, the environment being destroyed and all this. Okay. Cool. Okay. And, and, and he brainwashes her into becoming his own version of the evil cheetah. And he gives her like claws and stuff. But she has no super strength or anything. Right, right. So it seems kind of silly that she's the arch enemy of Wonder Woman. Right. Why would they go through all that trouble? Yeah. Yeah. And, Wonder and, Woman could like knock her out real easy. I don't you know. You know, it's funny. When you, when you mention that, because even though Superman existed in the Golden Age, whenever they'd come up with a new character, they'd seem to, it's almost like they couldn't wrap their mind around the fact of just giving everyone powers. Like, you mentioned, you know, our man, he can only have powers for an hour. And uh, all these characters from the All-Star Squadron, which were all from the 1940s, a lot of them, it's like, oh, this guy can ride a motorcycle, and this guy <laughs> can punch really hard. You know what I mean? Like, they don't actually have any powers. 
And here you go. It's like 1980, and they're still creating characters that she has really sharp fingernails, you know? <laughs> this guy makes the best French toast. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah, tremendous. Exactly. <laughs> it's like they could do anything, but yeah, I don't know. Anyway. Uh, oh, oh, I should mention Cheetah was created by Jerry Conway and Jose Delbo. I yeah. cannot wait to read that then. I'm going to dig that up tonight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Wonder Woman 274. Uh, and I'm going to read it on Valentine's Day. Anyway. I was I was surprised that she wasn't more prominent because, like, growing up, she was always in those cartoons, like the Legion of Doom cartoons. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it might have been a case where sometimes if they didn't have – if they didn't have villains around, they would just pull them from the old comics. That's actually where the Riddler became so popular because I think the Riddler only made two or three appearances ever. And then they had the TV show okay. and the right and the writers they were like, Hey, this old guy from the forties is really cool. Let's do a story with him. And that's what made the Riddler one of Batman's biggest villains is because of that. So maybe that's what happened with Cheetah, you know, would you consider the Riddler the second greatest Batman villain? Well, no, I would say, no, I would say fourth highest because it would be Joker, then probably Catwoman, then Penguin. Oh, then Cat! Penguin. Really, Catwoman and Penguin ahead of the Riddler. Yeah, only be, even if you go back, it, like the Joker appeared in Batman number one, and so did Catwoman, and Penguin was soon after, and Riddler was much later, I think, like a few years later. But how about coolest? Okay, coolest, yes, especially when <laughs> portrayed by Frank Gorshin, for sure. Yeah, he's tremendous. Yeah, he's great. Well, if we're talking about you know. Uh, What's her, what's her name? Julie Newmar. Cat oh, Wish. my God. She's number one. <laughs> I mean, you know, they say that kids, you know, don't become sexually aware. Until they get free, but when I was four years old, I knew that I was sexually attracted to Julie Newmar. <laughs> well, Black Canary's fishnets, that did for me. Oh, boy. All yeah. right. So uh, then we have Floronic Man. We've talked about him recently a lot. Yes. <laughs> Floronic Popping Man. Popping up, yeah. I didn't even know he existed. Now we've talked about him. Yeah. Uh, but basically, he's like a living tree, Floronic and, Man. Uh, and and this he's, is called Plant Master. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, for Floronic Man, the Plant Master. I yeah, mean. yeah. Uh, next, we have Killer Frost, and her na real name is Crystal Frost, and her first appearance was Firestorm 3, 1978, and yeah. she was created by Jerry Conway and Al Milgram. But basically, Mike, Al, she fell in love. She was a college student who fell in love with Mark Stein. The professor who uh, is part of Firestorm? Martin Stein, Mark right? Stein, yeah. yeah Martin, right. Stein. <laughs> Martin Stein. And uh, so, but he, he said, you know, I can't, uh, that's wrong for me to be uh, sexually, uh, you know, in a relationship with a student of mine. Plus, he's also married. So ah, he, he shot her down. He oh. was a man of integrity. Uh -huh. And she got pissed. And then she got caught in some sort of, uh, they were doing some sort of experiment and she was caught in like a big uh, meat locker. I don't know. <laughs> okay. She was caught in some sort of uh, cold tank. Okay. And it basically made her like a li like uh, living ice. Awesome. And so she's all chilled and she can control ice and shoot ice beams and stuff. Yeah. Great character. I love Killer her. Frost. Now, w w did she become prominent or was she just... Well, I mean, I first saw her because of Crisis, because she was all through Crisis. But then oh, okay. I didn't, she, yeah. she was never huge, but um, now she's on the Flash TV show. Oh, really? But it's like, it's not this version. It's like the next version of her, and they kind of make her good. So uh, it's not quite the same character. But yeah, basically, she's on the Flash. It can't really be called Killer Frost and be good. Yeah, I know. I kind of agree with that. Yeah. Next, we have The Mist. His first appearance was Adventure Comics 67 in 1941, created by Gardner Fox and Jack Burley. And uh, his real name is unknown, Michael. He's Whoa, unknown. interesting. But uh, he was a scientist. Always another, there's always scientists. They're always they're trouble, these scientists. Mm -hmm. And he, he devised a way to make himself invisible. And uh, he's like a bald guy with like the Hulk Hogan haircut, like the long hair. Yes, back. right. And, but it's gray hair. But eventually, Michael, he uh, his his powers uh, change, so he can actually turn himself into mist. Isn't that convenient? Yeah. So he called himself the Mist, <laughs> and uh, and I I was working on a comic book, Michael, with a character called the Mist, and now I'm gonna have to change it. Damn. <laughs> I know that really sucks. <laughs> All right. So anyway, uh, here we go. The Mist. His his arch enemy in this book is the Black Canary. Okay. 
And oh, did we mention uh, Killer Frost? Her villain or her hero is uh, Firestorm. Firestorm, right, right. The Martin Stein connection. So. Right, and they're opposites, right? Yeah. <laughs> so next we have the Monocle. Yeah. <laughs> this is getting this is getting into obscure DC territory. You get you now we're talking about characters I don't know anything about. Yeah. His real name is Jonathan Chaval, and his first appearance was Flash Comic 64, 1945, created by Gardner Fox and Joe Kubert. And basically, his <laughs> he was a kind of like a scientist who was really good at making lenses, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like for telescopes and microscopes. You see what I mean? One guy makes and, good French and glasses. Good lenses, yeah. So he wears a monocle that has special powers. <laughs> he, can, he can like shoot lasers and shit and do all kind of stuff. But that's his power, his monocle. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of looks like uh, George Perez kind of draws him like he looks like Stan Lee, I think. Yeah, you could say that. Yeah. Uh, ne- next up, uh, we have everyone's favorite and our buddy cousin Brandon's favorite, Psycho Pirate. Oh, yeah. It's funny because when we were talking about Psycho Pirate in uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, I, I knew I knew him from somewhere, but I didn't know where. Okay. And like I was, you... I was familiar with the name, and then when I went back and I looked at this book, I'm like, oh, yep, there's Psycho Pirate, because I believe he was dressed differently in Crisis, right? He wasn't wearing this outfit. Uh, was no, it was actually exactly this outfit. Really? Yeah. Huh. Because his, his, he has a very distinctive outfit. Like he has a, he wears like a, uh, like a, uh, like there's a hood over his head well, like okay. so so his hair is covered but his face is exposed but he he does have his medusa mask which you might have had on at the beginning of crisis maybe in the issue you read he had his medusa mask on no, his med- he didn't because i'd never seen that until i started reading up uh-huh. on him. Yeah. i mean there might have been maybe this has the black and red stripes and the other one doesn't but as far as i know it was the same outfit but i could be yeah, wrong yeah because this is like almost like a harlequin outfit you know like the old yeah. uh, black on one side red on the other uh, throughout uh-huh. the body and he's got kind of like a uh, a cape that sticks up behind him and his power Mike L is uh, he can whatever expression he puts on his face it makes whoever looks at him feel the same way yeah isn't that cool <laughs> it's interesting and, and you mentioned the Medusa masks and I guess this is like I don't know if this is the second psycho part because there was the old school psycho part yeah uh, this is the second I think yeah th- this one's name is Roger uh, Hayden and his first appearance was Showcase 65 in 1965, created by Gardner Fox and Murray Anderson. And uh, he got the original one got his powers from the Medusa masks, where there were, were three golden masks. Uh, like one, one would show a happy expression, one would show a sad expression, and one, I don't know what the third one was, horny? I don't know what was the other <laughs> one. I don't, I don't know. know either. <laughs> but uh, so he would wear these masks and it would give him power, and eventually the power just came into him and he could do it without the masks. Right? That's so great. Yeah. So a psycho pirate. And in this issue, his villain, or I always say villain because in my mind, these are the good guys. Right. Okay. <laughs> you but always the, root for the bad guys, right? But the heroes, the hero he is matched up with is our man. So, cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. So just a few more. Ragdoll. <laughs> real name Peter Merkel. First appearance Flash Comics 36, 1942, created by Gardner Fox and Lou Furstat. And his power, Mike Ellis, he's triple jointed. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. I so can he, crack my knuckles. Yeah. He can fold his body up into all kind of his, his ligaments and muscles are so loose that he can just fold up like a rag doll. And he, he wears an outfit like a big giant rag doll, like uh, Raggedy Ann and Andy, if you remember. Yeah. Those. It's, yeah. He looks exactly like Raggedy Andy, basically. Kind of scary looking, <laughs> eh? Like in a way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, he used to work in the circus and then he's like, Hey, I, I need to get some money. So he started robbing banks. And, well, well, the first thing he did, Mike, was he robbed a toy store cause he just, he just dressed up like a big giant rag doll and they put him in the store. And then when everyone left, he just robbed the place. That's freaking cool. Yeah. So there you go. Rag doll. And his, <laughs> his hero is, uh, the flash. That's who he's okay. Playing. Next we have signal man. His real name is Philip Cobb. <sighs> His first appearance, Batman 112, 1957, created by Bill Finger and Sheldon Moldoff. If I'm saying that correctly. 
think so. Uh, yeah. What do you know about Signal Man, Mike? Oh, I know as much as I found out by reading this issue. Really? Yeah, I really don't you know heart, anything. You heart Batman, and you didn't know about Signal Man? I think he kind of disappeared for like fifty years, though. Like I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he did. Yeah, uh, there you go. He's a he was originally a gangster, and okay. he wanted to like try and get the you know become a criminal master. So he said he looked around society, Michael, and you know what he realized? He said, "Wow, signals control everything, from stop signs to red lights." You know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be Signal Man. <laughs> and he wears this kind of garish red outfit, uh, red and yellow, and uh, he just uses signals. I don't know how, but somehow that makes him powerful. I yeah, like... <laughs> I know. I was trying to figure out in this issue exactly what he was doing, but I think it has to do with just, yeah, like um, almost like hypnotizing people, right? Uh, yeah. In, in this instance, that's how he uses it. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> but like, I don't think that's how he always does it. Okay. I, th I think in this book, he even says, I, I have a new invention, these. Gotcha. Uh, okay. Glowing spots or whatever. But anyway, uh, then... And his original, after Batman beats him originally, he goes to prison. And when he's in prison, Michael, he meets Bullseye, spelled with a hyphen, who I guess was the villain of Green Arrow. Okay, okay. And so he talks to this Bullseye fella. And then when he gets out of prison, Signal Man actually becomes, oh shit, what's he called? Uh, blue, Deadshot? No. No, Blue, uh, something like the Blue Archer or something like that. Okay, yeah, I think I remember that. Okay. So instead of Green Arrow, Blue Archer or whatever. Okay, okay. Uh, but yeah, and then he disappeared for a long time, and then I think he comes back here as Signal Man. Or at least Jerry Conway brought him back as Signal okay. Man. Okay. But I, I don't know if this was like his first appearance or not. I don't know. Sure. Um, all right, so then uh, that's all of them. That's everybody. All there. Right. And of course, Signal Man is going against Batman. Mm -hmm. So there we go. There's all the characters. I hope you were scoring at home. <laughs> the people. All right, so like I said, this story starts in the issue before this, right? and they kick it off. And I don't know, did you go back and read that issue? Oh, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah I really like that issue. I, I think of the three, that's the best written issue, I think. Probably, yeah. I, mean, I've only, I haven't read part three yet, but yeah, it was definitely really exciting to see how it all turned out, yeah. Yeah, so basically you just have uh, Ultra Humanite going around recruiting these villains. At least he recruits the ones from Earth 2, and then on Earth 1 he has Killer Frost recruiting them. Mm -hmm. And there's just like a one or two page... Uh, thing where they get the villain and they recruit him to their team. Like for instance, Signal Man is in the hospital. He's in some like prison hospital or something, right? And he escapes. And how does he escape, Michael? By jumping out a window and landing on a sign. Is that which doesn't make any sense? But okay. You know? <laughs> but the doctor even says, "How else would you expect a Signal Man to escape?" Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous. Yeah. And like uh, Ragdoll's holding up a bank. And he's a, he needs a getaway car, and uh, they pick him up in a car, and they're like, hey, come on with us. We'll help you. So that, that's basically it. They just go through, and they show all ten villains being recruited, or I guess mm -hmm. nine, because Ultra Humanite's already there. And, and then uh, the issue, they, they do defeat three heroes at the end of that issue. They, they, Monocle takes out Hawkman. Cheetah takes out Wonder Woman with help of the Washington Monument. How about mm -hmm. that, Mike? That was crazy. And then uh, the mist takes out Black Canary. So those heroes are already been defeated. All right. So that's where this issue starts. That's right. So take it away, Mike L. All right. So we have the Secret Society of Supervillains. Oh, huh? Real quick, we forgot to talk about the cover again. I, I always keep forgetting oh, about the cover. Okay. We got to talk about this cover. This is a good cover. It is. Uh, 60 cents. How about mm -hmm. that? 60 cents. Uh, November. And it also so, says all new right below that. Oh, yeah, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, all new, more pages. Mm -hmm. Exclamation yep. point. Uh, so at the very top of the issue, uh, there's an orange background. It says, it's war between the secret society of supervillains and the dot, 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 Justice League of America. Mm -hmm. And then under in a yellow box beneath it, it says, and guess who comes out the winner? Exclamation point. And then we got another blurb off to the left was saying, featuring the all-star Justice Society. Mm-hmm. And the cover pictures my buddy, the Ultra Humanite, reigning supreme, standing over a defeated Superman. Mm -hmm. And in the background, we see Batman, Firestorm, Flash, Adam, Our Man, and Johnny Thunder all knocked out. That's right. Oh, it's great. It's great. Yeah, I love it. Ultra Humanite. There's no beat in the big monkey. Mm -hmm. Tremendous. All right, Michael. So now. Now I can take it away. Yeah. 
So yeah, so the secret society of supervillains are gloating in their headquarters, and we've got one of those classic um, situations where the the captured superheroes are being kept in these uh, whatever you want to call it, like these stasis tubes, right? Yeah, they're just glass tubes. Right, I love that. And it's, they're they're hooked up to like a big centrifuge that comes right. to play later. <laughs> right, right, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we've got Ultra Humanite Cheetah, Monocle Mist, and then the hero, and then Cheetah, and then we've got the heroes are Hawkman, Wonder Woman, and Black Canary is right in the foreground there. So we can get a nice mm-hmm. shot of her fishnets yes, and her the rest of her uh, anatomy, right? Yes, we do. <laughs> and so they're all just kind of chatting it up and and they're talking about the plan and it's funny because then i love this then monocle says tell us again how the yeah. how the capture of these <laughs> 10 heroes will lead to an earth without heroes and then ultimately thinks how like children they are these pawns of my making needing <laughs> constant reassurance very well my friends and then of course he reiterates exactly how the plan is going to work but we still don't understand how because it's <laughs> yeah but this is like uh normally when you want to give exposition one way you do it is you have one character who doesn't know ask what's going on and right, right. Inform- here you have a character who already knows what's going on asks i'll dream and i to tell him again <laughs> yeah and that's you see that in a lot of movies and a lot of tv shows right tell me again why we're on this mission you know they're on the top of a mountain tell me again what we're doing here you know you see it all but the time I, but i love the panel it's a great panel george perez does where like uh, he shows the ultra humanite looking all serious and you know thoughtful uh, at the right bottom portion of the panel great and then shot, like his yeah. head just turns into the universe kind of like right the shadow and, right yeah, so you see the Earth One and Earth Two, and then they have he has four stacks of character faces representing each group of you know the villains and the heroes, and uh, like uh, uh, they're opposite. So uh, Firestorm is opposite Killer Frost, Black Canary opposite the Mist. It's tremendous. I really love mm-hmm. it. Very, and I didn't realize until later, but that's very Jim Starlin esque the way he oh, draws okay. that face with the shadow. Oh, that is true. Yep. Yeah, totally Jim Starlin. Like, yep. But um, but anyway, and so um, and then of course, uh, Ultra Humanite, as he's explaining to them the plan, which we talked about earlier. Earlier, he basically says, you know, uh, the resulting imbalance will correct itself by banishing all superheroes from one Earth. Which Earth? I do not know. But then there's a thought bubble, and yeah. that is a lie, of course. I know exactly <laughs> which Earth will be affected. My own, and then it just goes from there, right? Now, do you like that, or would it have been better had he? Uh had the readers not known that until Ultra Humanite reveals it at the end. It would have been better to reveal it later. Yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, anyway. And then we get, oh, this is my favorite scene of the whole book, possibly. We touch base with a psycho pirate. And yeah, because psycho- now, now the villains all have to go out. Like, there's still seven heroes out there. Right, right. So, so he's dispatched the other villains to go get their heroes. So, yeah, first up, we see Psycho Pirate versus Our Man. right. So he is at this um, charity dinner thing, and um, Rex TikTok Taylor is about to make a little <laughs> speech. What a great I think name! Tyler, right? Rex. Oh, Tyler. Tyler. You're right. You're right. And then, um, and then, of course, um, he's about to play a movie, but on, on like a on, a on an old projector. But Psycho Pirate has tied up the projectionist, and he's installed his own film reel into this, yes. you know, projector. And so he starts playing this movie, and it's so cool because the movie's playing on the screen behind our man, so he doesn't know what's going on. But the crowd all starts acting up and laughing. He's like, I don't understand, you know. You know, I, I'm no movie producer, but surely the film isn't that bad. And he turns around and he sees the psycho pirate on the screen using his powers of emotion manipulation by yeah. changing the expression on his face. So first he's making them laugh. Then he's making them all scared, right? Yeah, and, like the whole screen is just a close-up of his face. Exactly, yeah. It's so cool. And then, so then he, he kind of does like a little Superman and he kind of cuts behind the curtain and he's like, exit Rex Tyler, chemist, and enter his alter ego, the man of the hour, our man. <laughs> yeah, he's taking off his shirt just like Superman does, you know. Right. But, but yeah, so uh, Psycho Part is making the whole crowd scared. So they start screaming and running away and stuff. And yeah. Mm-hmm. It's good yeah, and it's so cool. And then he pops this pill, turns into um, our man. And then Psycho Pirate, he basically thinks he's won, so he's kind of gloating a little bit. But then Our Man comes in and punches him out, and uh, they start having this fist fight. But one of the key things about it is that Our Man is being very careful not to look him in the eye. Yeah, he's putting, his, he's 
he's putting his cape up in front of his face and stuff right. to, like, peek around it and everything and yeah oh it's so cool yep and it's actually <laughs> it, it, it's a strange detail but george perez actually adds in the exact time as yeah. each punch is being thrown so it's 8 14 20 then 8 15 08 and each well, time uh well, got, like, well, sorry go ahead you got to count down the hour because he's running he only has so much time oh you know? see you know what it's funny i wasn't even thinking that i was thinking more it was emphasizing how psycho pirate was changing his expression every minute or so but yeah you're right it's counting yeah. down yeah he's okay. got to beat the clock he only has an right. hour to beat psycho pirate and there, there's a great shot or a couple series of panels. Well, this next page is just spectacular. It's page great. Six. Yeah, because at the top we have three panels of Psycho Pirate trying different expressions. And then underneath the panel, there's a smaller uh, showing of our man punching Psycho Pirate. Like, well, the sadness didn't work. He punches him because he's not looking at him in the face. You right, know? right, right. But it's so awesome. They have the three panels and then the three little fight scenes underneath it. Yeah. And then... Uh, but what does uh, it looks like he has Psycho Pirate defeated, Michael? But then what happens? Then what happens is Psycho Pirate pulls out a new doohickey that he's got, the Psycho <laughs> Prism. It affects the light waves all around you, our man, so that no matter where you look, I'll be there. Yeah. And they show like a hundred Psycho Pirate faces, and yep. it's funny because the other expressions are very obvious, like crying, you know, laughing, fear. I don't know what this last expression is supposed um, to be. Yeah, he's he's trying to look sleepy. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's well, legit. Right. And then he, totally, he falls yeah. asleep. You're right. Yeah, that's legit. That's what he's doing. He's trying <laughs> to look sleepy. So that's then awesome. our man just falls asleep. Oh, so good. <laughs> oh, it's great. Yeah, it is really good. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So next up, Michael, we go to Earth One. Yep. And uh, yeah. that's a that's a great panel of uh, Batman swinging in with the city around him. It's like a. Uh, uh, it's kind of like a fish eye, so like the city's bending around him. Right. It's, it's tremendous. Uh, and so Batman, he's he's swinging through Gotham, and he sees a signal on a building, and he's like, huh, I wonder what that signal's for. We know what it's for, Michael. <laughs> signal man. That's right. Wearing a very garish 1940s <laughs> costume. Yeah, red, uh, like, uh, leotards, yellow underpants, green belt, yellow cowl, yellow cape, yellow gloves. Yeah. A green belt, yeah. It's, it's pretty true. ugly, but it's classic. So he he shines this big light in Batman's eyes and blinds him, and Batman, uh, you know, lets go of his rope and he and he's falling there. And uh, Signal Man's like, oh, he's got one shot to save himself. <laughs> and I, and I love how this is before the kind of Gatling gun that he had in the movie. So it oh, looks that's like right, yeah. yeah, it looks like he just got like a almost like a little pen shooter that shoots out the thing because it's not a gun. I don't even know what that is, eh? Yeah, almost like a flashlight that shoots out. Uh, yeah, a batarang with a yeah. string on it. Yeah, it's weird. And it wraps around a flagpole. Thank God there are so many flagpoles in big yeah, cities. Yeah, in Gotham, yeah. Well, even in New York City, like Daredevil always, in the old days, always relying on flagpoles, Spider-Man. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he, he saves himself, but he goes f crashing into a, a, a sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't he say something about that? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, signal Man says, you saved yourself from my signal attack by <laughs> breaking your fall on a movie marquee. Like, <laughs> how appropriate, Batman. Yeah. <laughs> I don't and know. And then it's so, it's just, uh, I mean, it's so cool because then Batman, again, this is pre-Frank Miller Dark Knight Batman, right? So he's not quite as gruff and tough as he was later. He's more just, you know, like a little bit more laid back, a little bit more light. And so, I don't know. I just think it's cool because I think the, the later Batman, he would never be in this position. He would always find a way to easily defeat the villain. But here he's a little bit more human, eh? Yeah, that's a great shot of him after he falls into the marquee and lands on the ground. He, he's uh, on his knees and he's holding his left arm because it's beat right. up. And, and it's a good shot there by Perez. That's great. And yeah. uh, Batman, he's talking to the, the crowd because the crowd's like, hey, do you want an ambulance? And he's like, later. I recognize that miniature bullhorn manipulated voice or amplified voice. Yep. It's because he has to explain why he can hear him, even though Signal Man's on top of a building. Way. <laughs> right, right, right. Phil Cobb, a small time crook whose big time idea led him to create a new identity as the Signal Man. <laughs> Bravo, Detective. It's nice to be remembered. Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> Considering all the time you fought, it's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, now he says, uh, I see you've noticed my newest gimmick, Batman. He's got a gimmick, like a wrestler. Uh, he has uh, <laughs> glow spots. <laughs> I love it. And they're th these little sparks popping up in the air around him. And Batman puts his cape up, you know, to, to shield himself. But what they're doing, Michael, is they're 
they're brainwashing the crowd. They're hypnotizing the crowd. Yep. And, and the crowd a- attacks oh, Batman. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> and what, what does Batman say here, Michael? <laughs> when they're attacking? Uh, they're attacking like robots. Blast signal man. He knows this is my one weakness. I can't fight back against in- innocent victims. Can't. And that's the end of Batman. <laughs> Yeah, we just see his hand sticking out above the crowd. Yep. And uh, it's so great. He can't fight back against innocent victims, so they just beat the holy hell out of him. I love yeah. it. Like, imagine love it. if that was the Michael Keaton or Christian Bale or even the cartoon Batman, he would just punch them all, right? I mean, <laughs> they're beating the shit out of him. So, anyway. Oh, uh, but it's the best. This could be my favorite thing in comic books ever. <laughs> yeah. Batman getting beat up. All right. <laughs> So there we go. Next up, we're back to Earth 2, and it's the Flash. And he's zipping around uh, looking for Ragdoll because he had uh, robbed that bank earlier. So the yeah. Flash is on his tail. And, and he runs across an old, while, like a wino on the docks. Right. And he's like, hey, have you seen Ragdoll? <laughs> or no, I got an anonymous phone call to come here. to, And, he, and the, the guy says, yeah, I saw him go that way. <laughs> on the, but here, that's no wino, Michael. That's the monocle. Right. <laughs> I love it. And then, yeah, so Flash goes to try and figure out what's going on, but then he can't he can't find the ragdoll. But then he turns around, and he's like, and uh, ragdoll is in this, um, what are those called? Yeah, they're on a ship. Yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, that's right, yeah, because he runs onto a ship. That's right, yeah. yeah. He's on a, uh, what is it, like, like an air exhaust, basically. Yeah, because Flash is like, there's nowhere here a man could hide. But, <laughs> but ragdoll's triple-jointed. <laughs> So he's in this like chimney thing. What are those called on a boat? I don't even know what they're called. I don't even know. Yeah. yeah. Indiana Jones hidden one, but anyway. Yeah. And then Flash uses his, I guess, super fast karate chop to cut it in half. Yep. But then Ragdoll leaps away. And then Flash uses another power. I didn't know Jay Garrett could do this, but he rotates his hands so quickly that he creates funnels so he can push himself up in the air. Like well, no, 20- actually, actually, Michael, I, again, I always have to explain stuff to you, but he's. <laughs> Ragdoll jumps into the cargo hold, and it's like a 40-foot drop. Oh, so he's going down. He's going he's down. He's lowering himself. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. Not he's lowering down. himself slowly by spinning his hands around. Right. Like, so the opposite of what I said. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and when he gets down there in the cargo hold, my girl, uh-oh, there's a bomb. Yeah. It blows up and uh, knocks him unconscious, but it doesn't have any effect on Ragdoll because, you know, he's triple-jointed. Exactly. <laughs> I still think it would have knocked him out too, but you know, whatever. You think, yeah. But again, what a cool costume, mate. Eh? Like, look at that ragdoll face. That's freaky. <laughs> it is frightening, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now we're back to Earth One. Mm-hmm. And and the atom just shoots right through a telephone. <laughs> I love <laughs> it. Yep. You're just riding the electrons there, eh? So cool. <laughs> the sound waves just pops right through the telephone. And and the cops like the atom, hey, startled me, little fella. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And they got some uh, Floronic man is uh, holding some greenhouse hostage or something. Right. Nuts. So then he joins them to go mm-hmm. investigate. And uh, <laughs> yeah, again. Um, so yeah, so now Floronic man or plant master or Woodrow, whatever the hell he is. <laughs> yeah, he's in this, yeah, I'm bl- drawing a blank here. Uh, greenhouse. Yeah. Yes, he's in a greenhouse. And he's got these humans uh, in these, um, what's it called? Uh, like gigantic um, Venus, Venus fly, fly tra- traps, right? Yep. And, uh, and the atom comes in and starts uh, punching out Plant Master, Floronic Man. And we got some really cool shots here. I wish everyone yeah. could see this. I hope you can. But um, basically, oh, we got a really cool overhead shot. I love the shot of the Plant Master about to step on him. Oh, on yeah. The bottom. It's just so a real cool. big foot right over there. Right. Right over the atom. Great shot. But of course, Adam gets out of the way. But then... So, um, so then Floronic Man drops these spores that grow vines. Mm-hmm. And, and they, they entangle Adam. But Adam shrinks. And he mm-hmm. slips out of the vines. So then what does Floronic Man do? So then he exhales um, pollen. Yeah. And, this, and, uh, and then Adam tries to get away from the pollen by uh, diving into this little pond there. And, uh, and oh, this is so cool. And he's like, why do you think I'm called Plant Master, Adam? Jason Woodrow learned the genetic secrets of vegetation. But the Floronic Man has become the master of all plant life. That pollen was bred to produce more than a simple allergic reaction. It causes unconsciousness, unconsciousness <laughs> in all who inhale it. 
so cool. And he just and he puts a stick in and like lifts the atom up out of the pond. Oh, it's a great shot. Yeah, the unconscious atom is draped over this stick. Right. Yeah, so cool. Next, Earth Two, and it's Johnny Thunder. Yeah. And he got some. Uh, he won some contest where he gets a new suit. <laughs> so he shows up. Yeah. He, he shows up at this fancy clothing store and says, "Hey, hey, what? Uh, rest your peepers on this, pal." It says I've won a free set of duds, so deliver. <laughs> so cool, eh? What a great plot line. You never have that nowadays, right? Yeah, so while uh, he's going in to get his new suit, actually, yeah, and this is the funny, remember I said well, the, the secret word to summon his thunderbolt is uh, say you, mm -hmm. and it's spelled differently, but it's pronounced say you. So here he's talking to the, uh, the store guy, and he says, say, comma, you warm up to a guy pretty quick, don't you? But because he said, say you, the Thunderbolt appears. Yep. Uh -huh. And the Thunderbolt senses that something's wrong. Uh -huh. Something's not quite right here. And Nobody's you know what's wrong? Me. It's Brainwave. Brainwave uh -huh. is there. And Brainwave just knocks out thunder the, the, the Thunderbolt guy. He just fries the little Thunderbolt's head. Mm -hmm. Knocks him out. I didn't know you could do that to a Thunderbolt. Neither did I. And then he just uh, starts shooting uh, some Brainwaves at Johnny Thunder. Mm-hmm. But then what does Johnny Thunder do, Michael? He sees that, like, uh, Thunderbolt st stuck in a bottle. Right. And he opens it up. And then um, what happens here? Well, it's not oh, actually right. Thunderbolt. You're not my T-Bolt. Right? That's, that's yeah. right. It's an illusion created by Brainwave, right? Yeah. Yep. yep. That's right. See, you know what's funny is, this is what's confusing to me, is later on there was a character named Brainwave Jr. that looked exactly like <laughs> this guy here. Well, you know why? Because Brave Wayne Jr. was his son. Oh, well, there you go. And so I believe he, I believe this brainwave died by saving his son. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, gotcha. See, I never knew that backstory. And then he gave his psionic powers to his son. Right, okay. So there you go. <sighs> so that's back to Earth one. Yes, and this is, we got, uh, what'd you say his name was? The Firestorms? Uh, Ronnie Raymond. Ronnie Raymond uh, and some girl. They're about to sit down and watch some TV and have a hamburger. <laughs> but nope there's a news broadcast killer frost is on the loose so yep. and oh yeah and here we go we see an example of them forming a firestorm and like uh martin stein is at a restaurant eating dinner and he just disappears exactly isn't that awesome oh <laughs> and the waiter says no more sampling the house wine for this waiter yeah. i think i'll go lie down <laughs> <laughs> great <laughs> Tremendous. So yeah, so uh, Firestorm goes to fight Killer Frost, and uh, they're duking it out. She freezes him, but he just melts the ice. But how does she beat him, Michael? Let me. Uh, ref oh yeah, so uh, I can't remember how she defeats him. Well, well, she ices up the ceiling, like she's shooting. Oh, that's right. Yeah, she shoots ice beams at him, and he's dodging. He's like, "What? You're not so good." And she's like, "No, nah, I wasn't aiming at you." Boom, and the ceiling just collapses on him, mm -hmm. and that's how she beats him. Which, you know, again, with how powerful he is, yeah. he should have been able to easily defeat her, but whatever. And I don't know if I mentioned this before. I wanted to make a point of this when we were talking about Firestorm, but the one thing cool thing about him is his head is just like fire. On Always on fire. Head. You know what's funny? <laughs> I didn't, like, when I was a kid, I thought he had the coolest costume. Okay? Yeah, I liked it, yeah. Yeah, and I have a toy, and the weird thing about his costume is he has really baggy um, arms, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. very unusual for superhero, plus, like you said, his head is on fire. <laughs> Plus, he has this really cool, like, symbol on his chest. It's not quite, it's not an atomic symbol, but it's a really cool symbol. Yeah, it looks but, like it, though. It's yeah, not, but it's similar. No, yeah. it's similar. But apparently, like, later writers, like, Grant Morrison and, like, 90s uh, writers or artists, they didn't like his costume at all, but I always thought it was great. Yeah, I liked it a lot. Really original. Because they call him Firestorm, the Atomic Man or something? Exactly, or? yeah. Oh, no, the Nuclear Man. Nuclear Man, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> nuclear Man. So cool. All right, so next up, we have Earth 2. And yeah. it's Superman, and he's flying around the uh, Metropolis City Zoo. Oddly enough, Michael, in the previous issue, the monocle defeated Hawkman at a zoo as well, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is weird. <laughs> but, but he shows up at the zoo because there's a sign in the gorilla cage that says, Bring me Superman. And if you look closely, there's an albino gorilla right next to that sign. Ah. <laughs> yeah, do you see that? Yeah. And uh, so Superman enters the cage and says, Hey, what's this? I wonder what this is about. And boom, it's ultra-human, I jumping on him. 
Mm-hmm. And, and they start fighting. But Ultra Humanite's not alone. He also has his monkey friends. Yes. All, the, all the other gorillas. His, his apish allies, you mean? <laughs> yes. That's Yeah, the alliteration makes that much better than monkey friends. Yep. Apish <laughs> allies. And uh, But Superman, you know, he, he makes short work of the monkeys. And then he starts blow. Then uh, next we see Ultra Humanite riding on an elephant. Mm-hmm. And Superman just blows over the elephant with his big gusto wind. Blows it up. Yes. And then, and then what does Ultra Human I do, Mike? This is so cool. He he, he um I, he's like he shoots this out of his chest, but it's green kryptonite in a fine spray. Yeah. And then Superman says, Trick me, pain so great, blacking out. But basically, yeah, it just envelops his entire body in kryptonite. It's <laughs> it, 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 it's so powerful, it erases the symbol from his chest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you notice that? I'm and he's watch. just like glowing green. Right. Uh, oh. And he's just covered in kryptonite. Mm. Now, theoretically, that would kill him, right? Like, I mean, be yeah, because basically, unless he gets rid of the kryptonite very quickly, yeah, he'll eventually just die. Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. But yeah, Ultra Humanite, he, he, he just let Superman defeat the monkeys and the elephants just to give him a sense of, you know, security. Like, oh, I've, I've defeated Ultra Humanite. But no, then he springs the, the kryptonite mm. mist on him and mm-hmm. takes him out. It's a great. It's so good. I so then, it. so then, all the hill, all the heroes have been defeated. All ten of them. Mm-hmm. So next, we we go back to Ultra Humanite's uh, secret headquarters, which I think is in the mountains of Nepal, right? It's on, yeah, uh, I think so. And it's like this big triangular, um, like almost a like a gl- glass pyramid kind of. Yeah. Thing. And it's got like four levels, and uh, looks like some escalators. So that's nice. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so uh, they got all the heroes in their little tubes. Superman is still glowing green. And yeah, this is, uh, we've got to talk about this in a second. But uh, so they're in this big centrifuge and he just starts spinning the centrifuge. Mm-hmm. And you see some Kirby crackle. Mm-hmm. Yep. And some sound effects. And then boom, an explosion. And that's it. They're gone. They're what all is Ultra- dead. You want to read what Ultra Humanite says here at the end? Like the watch, uh, watch as it begins to turn faster and ever faster when it attains maximum speed. A space-time warp will be open between our reality and limbo. In that instant, the superheroes will leave our cosmos and nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever be the same. Yeah, so there yeah. it is. Yep. To be concluded, next issue. Oh, I had to get that next issue. Yes. Oh, my God, eh? What That's a so setup. Uh, now, spoiler alert. Uh, oh wait do, <laughs> they don't I, I, die <laughs> yeah you haven't read the next issue neither has anyone else but you know the the good guys they they prevail in the end oh, okay. obviously but w- what happens is the uh, other villains from Earth 1 they figure out that he had been lying to them okay Ultra Human had been lying to them and so they're getting real mad but before they can you know take action Ultra Human I just teleports them back to Earth 1 he's like beat it suckers see ya Mm-hmm. So then Ultra Humanite and his Earth 2 buddies, they just start running wild on Earth 2. Robin Banks, and it's very creepy. Brainwave kind of kidnaps a lady and implies that he's just, you know, using her for sexual pleasure. It's Jeez. very strange. Yeah, huh. it's very strange. Uh, so, but on Earth 1, those villains are still mad. So they figure out a way huh. to get onto uh, the Justice League satellite. Okay. They trick Green a Lantern. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and Elastic Man, I believe, also is there. You and mean Plastic Man or Elongated Man? Elongated Man. I can right. I combine the two of them. <laughs> elongated <laughs> Man. And uh, so they, because they, I, I believe the Justice League has a teleporter to Earth 2 or something like that. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah, I think so. I don't know. Or to Limbo. They need to go to Limbo. Mm-hmm. So they go to Limbo and they free the heroes. And but when they free the heroes, Michael Superman, that that kryptonite stuff's just gone. Interesting. Yeah, they don't even have to hose them down or anything. It's just gone. Okay. So then the heroes, <clears throat> they they beat up those villains, and then they go back to Earth one, the Earth two, and they beat up the Ultra Humanite, and then they put them all into limbo. That's great. That's so there you go. But uh, I I highly recommend reading all three issues because it's just very yes. fun. Yeah. I will be. Although I don't think. Uh, Perez inks the third issue, but I don't think he pencils it. I think Keith oh. Pollard is the penciler. Oh, you know what? I love Keith Pollard, but that's that's really too bad. Yeah, because the art takes a step back. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Like, 
Uh, we can talk about George Perez later, but I mean, yeah, that you can. No one can fill George Perez's shoes. I don't think so. Well, let's go ahead and talk about George Perez now, because he only did ten issues of uh, Justice League. Oh, and it was uh, it, it was from one eighty four to two hundred in that span. He did ten issues. Wow. Yeah. See, I, I mean, obviously, by the time he did Crisis, he was a better artist. But this issue and the one before were so freaking good. I mean, yes. Oh, like. Again, you, you maybe there's other artists that can draw anatomy a little bit better or this a little bit better or that a little bit better. But he, it's like he's the master of the page. He knows exactly, like, every panel is its own, like, masterpiece. You know what I mean? He puts so much effort into it. And it's like, even if you just look at it, it's like one page will be closer. Then the next page is a silhouette. Then the next page is, you know, the guy's face, you know, you know, with the, with the flashbacks behind him, but there's always something different in each panel, eh? Yeah, the art here is tremendous. <clears throat> and uh, if you recall, Michael, my big complaint, even though I, I respected his art in Crisis, the mm -hmm. big complaint was the abundance of panels. Sure. How every page was so crowded and it wasn't pleasant to read. That is not a problem here. That's this, true. This is a delight to read. <laughs> it's it's <great>. yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, this is. Top-notch George Press stuff. I think he was like 26 here. Wow! Oh my God! I, I think so. Yeah. And and that's well. the thing is, I mean, I can. I there are some people that don't like George Perez, but you've got to give him credit at least for effort. Like the guy, I mean, considering the way that people are artists are now with deadlines and missing issues, and they do one issue, then there's three fill-ins. Like this guy was just always at the top of his game, and he never really declined. You know, like if you look at um, John Byrne and Frank Miller, like as the years went by, honestly, they got worse and worse and worse. But George Perez, I think he, 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 he kept his A game going for his entire career. Unfortunately, now he's retired, but. There, there are just so many iconic panels <clears throat> in this issue and in the previous one. Like I said, even though I haven't read these books in, you know, almost 40 years, I still remember these panels. Yeah. Like I, I still remember that one of our man and all the faces of uh, psycho pirate, you know? Like that was in, you know, just ingrained in my mind and the, the, the stuff with Adam and the Floronic man. Right. Uh, there was some great stuff there. Yeah. It's just really good stuff. So hats off to George Perez. Absolutely. Uh, now, Jerry Conway, <clears throat> all told, he did about 101 issues of Justice League. It's incredible. Yeah. And like you said, he had like a, an uninterrupted run, uh, which was probably from 151 to two, <clears throat> excuse me, from 151 to 216. So that was probably, you know. How we do the math there? But then he kept going though, right? Yeah. Then, then he only missed like one or two issues, and then he did uh, another one, and he had another one. So he his final issue was two fifty five. That's right. <clears throat> so all told, uh, from nineteen seventy five to eighty six. That's he, incredible. <laughs> working off and on on, because like I said, he started at DC on Justice like he on his first time there. Then he left, came back, and he did it again. And so, well, I guess his first time in DC when he was breaking in the business. Mm -hmm. Okay, then that's went, right. Yeah, then he went to Marvel, and and then he was the Wonder Kid in Mar in Marvel, and you know, editor in chief, right? And then he left there, went to DC, worked a little bit, like for like a year and a half, then went back to Marvel, and then came back to DC. It's very <laughs> confusing, but um, uh -huh. yeah, but the big run on Justice League, I I think at the time, I can't imagine anyone has written more Justice League issues than him now, even, but. At the no. time he left the book, he had written the most Justice League issues ever, even more than Gardner Fox. Wow. So that's And impressive. you know, I think that also goes for Spider Man. I guarantee maybe now he's been beaten by um what's his name? Uh Dan Slott. But for a time, Jerry Conway absolutely wrote more Spider Man comics <laughs> than anyone. Because he had a fifty issue run on Amazing. Then he had a I don't know what, another 50 issue run on spectacular and a 50 issue run on web. Wow. So to me, he's got to have written more than anyone, I think. Yeah. When I was reading about his, uh, I guess a lot of people like his justice league stuff, although towards the end they were getting, uh, I read a couple of things mm -hmm. about his run on justice league. And I guess people don't correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but at some point they did justice league Detroit. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it wasn't called that at the time, but that's kind of what it's colloquially known as now. But yeah, it was he they kicked out almost all the original members and it was just Aquaman and Martian Manhunter and then they then they got 
all these new members like Gypsy, uh, Vixen, Vibe, and <laughs> the vibe, that's right. Steel. Steel, I think. Yeah. yeah. And it, it just, I mean, I like it and it's fun and it's got good art, but it was really like the fans did not like it at all. Yes. That's what I gathered when I was reading these <laughs> things about, because uh, I guess Aquaman was the leader. Right. And, um, and then I read an interview with Conway, and he said, yeah, it didn't make much sense that the leader was an ocean-based hero in a city near a lake. Right. He said, you know, it sounded like a good idea at the time. <laughs> 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 but, but I guess his end with DC wasn't enjoyable. He did not. I guess uh, DC was treating him rather poorly towards the end of the run. Like they were um, controlling what he could do and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he, he was not happy with the way his run ended on Justice League and too bad. with DC. Yeah. Well, you know, I can say one thing. I've been reading and rereading a lot of Bronze Age comics lately. Like, as you know, like, if we read one issue of a, of a comic, I'll usually go and read the next 10 just to kind of, you know, yeah. get a feel for that run. And sometimes I'm like, okay, I don't need to read any more of this. I'm done. But after reading this one issue, I am so pumped to read his entire 11-year <laughs> run. You know, I can't wait. I'll, all right. So I'll say this about Jerry Conway here in the writing. The premise of this is glorious. Getting yes. all these villains together, recruiting them, watching them be recruited and matching them up against their, their rivals. And uh, I love that. Now, the basic idea of Ultra Humanite's plan makes it's no insane. sense. No, it makes no sense. <laughs> but just buy in and just right. enjoy it. It's That's fun. Right. This is a perfect superhero comic book for that. Uh, now, the, the nuts and bolts writing, like there are some really awkward stuff here. Like more in this issue than I think in the previous one, like 195 and 196 might even be a little, or 197 might even be a little worse. Uh, but it's still good. But there right. are some, there are some clunkers mm-hmm. <laughs> throughout. But it's all right, you know, whatever. It's still a really fun book, so mm-hmm. it's it's enjoyable. Definitely. Uh, what, what would you give this one out of ten, Michael? Oh, uh, who? Um, with, again, with the understanding that this is squarely set in, what is this, 1981? Yes. Like, this is state of the art 1981, so on a 1981 scale, I'll give it an 8 out of 10. Yeah, it's, it's really, really good. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go 9 just because I, uh, the childhood affection for it. Yeah, you know what, I think I'm, you know what, yeah, I'm going to give it a 9. I'm going to give it a 9 because at this time, there probably wasn't anything better. Like, this is awesome. Yeah, it, that's exactly, that's the perfect word to describe it. Awesome. Right. <laughs> like, if you're a kid and you want a superhero comic book, it does not get better than this. Right. It's great. Yeah. Now, my other it. only uh, concern, let me ask you this about the plotting and, uh, <clears throat> like, so Ultra Humanite recruits all these arch nemesis of these heroes. Uh, but then, like, why, I think the implication is that Ultra Humanite has somehow coached them up to teach them how to beat their their rival because all these like B and C level villains they really ru- just run through these heroes with no trouble you know what it I mean? is yeah it is kind of that's the one thing i don't like about like for example i i never like a story where batman just gets captured and like knocked out <laughs> Because to me, if they could do that, they could just kill him. Just put a gun to his head and shoot him, right? <laughs> well, well, they can't do that here because they need him to send him to limbo to right, off the right, bounce. Right, right, yeah. But, uh, yeah, they had to take them all alive for mm-hmm. this. But um, it just seems like I wish they would have done a little bit because you recruit all these villains. You get these ten villains working together. Maybe attack these heroes five on one. You know, mm-hmm. why? Like, why should Ragdoll right. beat the Flash now? Yeah. When he couldn't beat him all these other times. Like, I don't understand what was different. I guess you had the monocle kind of helping him out with, you know, mm-hmm. setting the trap. I just wish they would have made it a little more um, like Ultra Humanite devised these clever ways. Like Ultra Humanite gave Psycho Pirate that prism, you know? Or, yeah, 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 that's but, a good point. Like some way to differentiate this encounter with the heroes mm-hmm. from all the past encounters when they got their just you know beaten easily yet somehow you know signal man's beating batman within like five seconds you know that's a good point yeah well that's what i mean like to me that is so obviously not the post frank miller batman just how easily he gets defeated you know and how nice he is you know and i think it would have been better if you see the five villains working together to beat the one or or maybe if they switched partners like 
All right, so Batman always beats Signal Man, but maybe Signal Man could beat Firestorm. Sure, you know, like, like Acts of Vengeance, right, yeah. exactly. But I don't know, it's small. I, I Let's put it this way, I think there's room that this story could have been even better. Yeah, <laughs> but it's yeah like that's why it's a 9, not a 10, right? <laughs> yeah, like if Ultra Human I didn't reveal that he had known all along until the very end, I think it would have been better. Um, but yeah, so it's still really, really good. And yeah. I would recommend going back and reading uh, the part before this and the part after this, just to... Mm-hmm get the whole story so there yep. you go michael justice league 196 a batman story i picked a batman story believe it this is a comic after my own heart again this is one that i eventually probably would have got around to but now <laughs> it's okay because you picked it so now it's kind of like <laughs> yes. it. yeah all right speaking of my pick so there's a certain movie that's coming out soon not Birds of Prey, because unfortunately... Oh, that's what I was going to say. No, there was, was no, Birds bird, of Prey. no Birds of Prey in the Bronze Age, no Harley Quinn in the Bronze Age. Oh, that's right. So instead, I had to go with another movie that's coming out. So next week, we are going to be reviewing New Mutants number four. Wow, nice. Yes, by Chris Claremont, Sal Buscema, or Buscema, and Bob McLeod. Yeah, I always, we've gone over their names. We've said Sal and John so many times on this podcast, and I always forget how they pronounce their name. I always, as a kid, said Bushema, but I think it's Busima. Busima? I think. Busima. You know what? You might be right, because I used to say Buscema. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I think you're right. And then the Steve Bushimi, Bushemi. So yes. yeah, I thought that's why it's always confusing. That. But I've, they did, you know that book, How to Draw Co- Comics the Marvel Way, uh, with Stanley and John Busima? They also did a video version of it. That you could order, like a VHS. Yes, that's right. That's right. And Stan Lee and John Busima are there, and, and I believe Stan Lee says his name, John Busima. Uh, okay. I think I couldn't okay. remember it properly. I don't know, but uh, but yeah, I always say it wrong either way. But Sal and John, two yeah. of our favorite artists. Right? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I totally forgot Sal was even doing the art back then on the because what uh, Sinkevich didn't come in until when? Like I think ni- nineteen. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and that's the thing is like, eventually I'd like to do that stuff, but I figured we'd do this early stuff first. Right. Yeah. Cause his covers were so iconic. Oh, beautiful. He's like a fine artist. Yeah. And you know who hired him to do that book? Ann Nocenti. <laughs> that's right. Ann Nocenti, our beloved. Love artist. of my life. Yep. <laughs> friends with her on Facebook. <laughs> and by friends, you mean she's she said like ha ha once to you yeah and i stalk her yeah <laughs> i think she liked my gif i think she posted a photo of herself when she was young and i posted a gif of bugs bunny with his heart bursting out of his chest <laughs> and she liked my gif and so i don't know i think that means she has a crush on me I don't yeah know. i think you're going steady is what yeah yeah <laughs> exactly all right so Woo. there it is uh, now what issue did you say again number four number four sal Bushema's first issue Busima. Oh, sorry who was drawing it before him Bob McLeod. Wow, I don't even, I'm not even familiar with his work at all. Yeah, Bob McLeod's a great artist. You'll see when you do your research, he's a great artist. Yeah, so there you go. New Mutants number four. What what year was that, did you say? This is 83. Really? That's, I would have guessed probably like 85 ish or so. Yeah, 83. How about that? All right. Well, I'm excited. Yeah. For that. I'm excited. Oh, my. Yeah, I'm super pumped. Hey, it might go. Just when we were talking, like I was thinking about other, because I think I'm going to do All Star Squadron next. Awesome. Because uh, we talked about, it. but I, I was just thinking of another comic book I could do, which would be a totally random pick. Uh, Gru the Wanderer. Oh yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to love Gru the Wanderer. <laughs> it's a great no. You you know what's funny is like we may think of it as like this you know funny you know Mad Magazine thing, but. It is very well respected in the industry. Like he's a great. What's his name? Sergio. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Yeah, it's like Argione or something. Yeah, Aragon. Like it's Aragonese, but that's the English. <laughs> I don't know. It's not that. But I used to. I, I haven't thought of Guru in many years, but for some reason it just popped into my mind while we were talking. And uh, thanks to Guru, I learned what mulch was. Remember okay. Was just to mulch. Do you remember that? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, like mulch. Yeah, mulch. I know what mulch is. Yeah, like you know. Ground up compost and stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. So there you go. Maybe we'll uh, we'll talk Guru at some point as well. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. I guess that wraps up this yep. week's episode. So everyone, please be sure to uh, find our show. It's actually under Comic Book Syndicate on um, Spotify, 
Stitcher and iTunes or Apple Podcasts. And then uh, also on Twitter, on Facebook, on uh, YouTube, and our Comic Book Syndicate website. Um, I guess that's pretty much it. We do a different we have- we have more platforms than listeners, Mike. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at the uh, statistics for our episodes, and let me just tell you, it's not pretty. All right, <laughs> but anyway, we're not going to be we're not going to be attracting any advertisers anytime soon. But, <laughs> but that's okay. But hey, if you're listening out there and you enjoy the show, please feel free to comment, email us at mailacomicbooksyndicate.com, share this with your friends, tell them all about it. A different Bronze Age comic every week. As always, Mike L. and Mike Dell, and this has been Flea Market Fantasy. See you next time.